pretty new. Yeah. Let's just just to get some context. You were born in the early 1930s. 31. You, yes. Okay. You um, you got a chance to live through, uh, if not the original general relativistic and quantum revolutions, their consequences. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, you were able to take classes from people like uh, Paul Dirac, who scarcely seems like a, a human being, sometimes more like a god. Uh, oh, yeah, that was an experience. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I, when I was at Cambridge as a graduate student, you so see, I did my undergraduate work at London University, University College, and then I went to Cambridge as a graduate student. And I went to do algebraic geometry, so I wasn't trying to do physics at all. Uh, and I, I'd encountered a friend of my brother's, Dennis Sharma, when I think I was at University College as an undergraduate. And he given a series of talks on uh, cosmology. Well, it started with the, the Earth, and then he sort of worked his way out, and then talked about what was then referred to as the steady state theory, uh, where the galaxies, the, the universe expands and expands and expands, but it doesn't, doesn't change because all the time there is new matter created, hydrogen, and the universe expands and then you get new material and it keeps replenishing uh, what gets lost. And it, I thought it was quite an intriguing I mean, I, Dennis was a great fan of this model, and so I was really taken by it. So that, well, the story was that I was in Cambridge visiting my brother, my older brother Oliver, who did statistical mechanics, and he was actually much more precocious than I was. He was two years ahead, and he was, I think, finishing his research there. But um, I had been listening to these talks by Fred Hoyle, and he was talking, I think, in his last talk about how in the steady state model the galaxies expanded away, expanded away, and then when they reach the speed of light, they disappear. And I thought, that can't be quite right, and I started drawing pictures with light cones and things like this. And I thought, well, they would, sim they would fade, gradually fade, but they wouldn't just disappear. And when I visited Cambridge, I visited my brother, and we were at this the Kingswood restaurant in Cambridge. And I said to my brother, I said, well, look, I don't understand what Fred was saying. It doesn't sort of make sense to me. And he said, well, I don't know about cosmology, but sitting over there on the table is a friend of mine. He knows all the answers to these things. And that was Dennis Sharma. And so I explained this problem I had to Dennis, and he was pretty impressed because he, didn't, he said he didn't know the answer, but he would ask Fred, <laughs> Fred Hoyle. And the, the main thing was that when I did come up to do graduate work in, gen, in uh, algebraic geometry, uh, Dennis decided to take me under his wing and try to persuade me to change my subject and, and do cosmology. So you were simultaneously under the great uh, geometer Hodge as well as Dennis Sharma? Well, Hodge was my supervisor. All right. See, Dennis was just a friend. I see. Hodge was my supervisor originally until he threw me out and, and Todd became my supervisor. That's another little story. <laughs> but, uh, but Dennis just wanted to get me interested, uh, do work in cosmology. This was it. I never, he wanted me to change my subject. I learned an awful lot from Dennis about physics because Dennis sort of knew everything and everybody. And he had a real knack of getting if he thought two people should meet each other, he got made sure they did meet each other. In one case, it was Stephen Hawking. But uh, Dennis was actually, uh, he, uh, when you mentioned Dirac, Dennis was actually the last graduate. Well, at the time, he was the only graduate student of Dirac's. Is that right? Yes, Dennis was, was Dirac. Dirac right? was famously sort of uh, difficult, I think, that... You know, in recent years, yeah. this book came out of Graham Formella, The Strangest Man That Puts Dirac's Bizarreness. Yes. Uh, he was difficult, difficult to get to know. Well, there's a bit of an irony here. I mean, certainly he was hard for physicists and so on to get to know him. Now, there were two people. And I actually, knew. maybe if I could just say one thing to our listeners. Yes. 
in my estimation, if not yours, Dirac would be neck and neck with Einstein for the greatest of 20th century physicists. I think I wouldn't be far off that, that description. For so, some reason, his press wasn't nearly as good, maybe because of his hair. I don't know. <laughs> well, he didn't talk much. This is one of the problems. No, I agree. I think he, he was... Um, I mean, you think about all the quantum mechanics people who developed that amazing subject. And Dirac was really the one who put, put it all in order and so on. Well, 